Welcome to Hope Talks Podcast with Grayson Willis and Pastor Margaret Michael, where you'll hear inspiring stories that are filled with hope and good news in Jesus Christ. You can also search for our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and TuneIn. We would love your feedback and invite you to take a short, anonymous survey. You can find the link to the survey in the show notes. Welcome to today's broadcast of Hope Talks. I'm Grayson Willis. And I'm Pastor Margaret Michael. Thanks for tuning in today. And Pastor Margaret, would you like to introduce our guest today? Oh, sure. I've known this guy since he was about, I don't know, six years old, maybe. Um, He's been around the church in different capacities. It's been a real encouragement to watch him grow. And over the years, uh, I just think about different uh, phases of your life um, and just where you are today. It's just amazing that you're sitting here with us. And today, I would love to welcome... Jacob Booker. Jacob, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah. it's good to have you here. Um, my first recollections of you are when we had Kids Harbor years ago. Started out in the Wesley Kitchen right off of the side of the sanctuary before we added on the second yeah. phase of our building. And um, so welcome. We are excited today to hear your story, um, testimony of what God's doing in your life. And I really believe that Those listening today are going to find hope in your story because Jesus uh, showed up in your story, and that always brings hope, don't it? Yeah. Um, And so if you want to just start out today, tell us a little bit about how you grew up. You know, I know that your story had an interesting beginning, right? (laughs) Um, So you just share with us what you would like to share as you're journeying towards um, where you are today. We want to hear how it started. Well, I was... Uh, born in an orphanage home in Romania, about six months old. I have a sister that was adopted too from Belarus. Uh, she's a little younger than me. We took family vacations, you know, as kids growing up. Had a lot of fun. Went to beaches as family and visited my parents' friends in North Carolina. Went up to Pennsylvania for years when my grandma Booker was still around. Mm-hmm. She was the one that was the biggest prayer warrior in our family uh-huh. for me. Mm-hmm. Especially when I was in my addiction to alcohol. Yeah. She would just pray for me and pray for me, you know, every day. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she, uh, I could kind of figure she knew I struggled with something, but you know, we just, I never told her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually she knew. And the day before she died, she said uh, to my dad that I was going to be all right. You know, she said, "Don't worry anymore." You know? wow. I don't know how wow. she knew. She knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She had some insight yeah. as yeah. prophecy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we would. Um, Play in the backyard, soccer all the time. I grew up playing soccer in Rockingham County mm. as a kid and played basketball and tennis um, through high school, soccer through high school, and uh, skied and snowboard for many years. Mm-hmm. Dad's been teaching at Mass Nutton since 72 probably, a long time. And as a kid, I grew up with him and skied on our ski team for Mass Nutton. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of activities, and it was probably in my probably seventh or eighth grade Freshman year, it's when I found uh, uh, drugs, narcotics, and alcohol, mm-hmm. and uh, I knew I was wasn't myself. I struggled with depression. I think that's when it started. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got bullied a lot as a kid, so I coped with narcotics mostly in the beginning, and then I got into alcohol and partying later on mm-hmm. in my high school. Um, met the wrong kind of people, you know, yeah. MTC and public schools. Yeah, and that's how my Pretty much my addiction started, and it just progressed from there. And I had um, about three DUIs over the years, and uh, drinking just was out of control. Yeah. And I didn't think it was. thought it was fine. Yeah. yeah. Don't we always? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until but, we're not, right? <laughs> yeah. But it got me in a lot of trouble with a lot of fines and expensive lawyers and hurt and pain through my parents. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, it's pretty much a basic go. Yeah. yeah. So you grew up going to church. Mm-hmm. Um, you grew up, you know the Bible stories. You were in Sunday school, and um, your parents made sure that you had a foundation. It's what you do with it that matters, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. God doesn't have any grandchildren. Mm-hmm. So we have people, our parents usually, that give us, or our parents that adopted us, right? right? And they help us with that foundation. But then there has to be this, we can't live on those coattails. And so sometimes... The road looks pretty bumpy as we figure out our own life. And I think with being adopted, that only added to who am I, you know, who are my parents, you know, who are are my birth parents. Uh, So many questions 
that you have answers to. And I think that only adds to um, the struggle of um, life. I can only imagine. So I know that when you were pretty young, your mom had some health issues. You want to talk about that and just how that impacted you? Again, you know, if someone's in your life and now, you know, yeah. Yeah, When I was, I can remember at the age of five, five years old, in 1995, uh, that's when it got pretty serious. She had a brain tumor. It's a form of cancer in your brain. It affected her tremendously. Um, We had to call the rescue squad a lot back then because she had seizures a lot. Mm -hmm. There was always a trip to the hospital a lot, as I remember. And I remember it affected me pretty hard as a kid. It scared me. I didn't want to know when the rescue squad was coming again. Mm. So I knew when the lights came on upstairs that something happened again. So I would take my blankets in my bed and just cover my head so I didn't have to listen to it. Yeah. So I knew the EMS guys were coming up again. Mm. And I'm like, uh, it was just, it impacted me pretty hard. Yeah. Um, she was in UVA and RMH and all kinds of places. Also, when I was 13, I had meningitis and she was around me too much. Um, she had cancer and then she got it affected her somehow. I remember her falling down the steps at the doctor's office. I didn't know what was going on because I was confused. So I was pretty mm-hmm. sick. But it affected me and my sister pretty hard, I know. Mm-hmm. So we watched her come home from the hospital after having probably 15 staples across her head, mm-hmm. having brain surgery. Yeah. But I remember uh, she's a fighter and oh. <laughs> never gives up. That's right. And um, she's still here today. She doesn't drive anymore, but we have a couple home care helpers that help out. She's still the same mom, and she just keeps going. She's so full of love. And when I was at the Image Recovery Center at RMH and worked with people who had cancer or things that changed their appearance due to disease or treatment, and she was also, I I met her there, but I also met her as a volunteer at the hospital. And so I've known your mom as long as I've known you, um, and I remember those events that you just talked about. And it takes me back um, to where the tapestry of our lives were already beginning to overlap. And um, your mom has a real special place in my heart. I just have to say that today. Um, And she is a fighter, but she's taught you how to fight. You've learned that from her. And so I didn't want to miss being able to say that to you today, the profound impact that having her as your mom and your dad as your dad, um, I believe they were the right people. Um, And so grateful for those folks that say yes to someone that needs a home. Anyway. Yeah, kind of feeding off of what Pastor Margaret was saying about how your parents, if you want to share about the impact that they've had on your life, they adopted you, but it goes beyond that, just the support during the struggles that you've had. Right, all right. Um especially when I was getting in trouble. First kind of trouble I got was probably, I was probably 19. It was my first time going in uh, uh, to the, I always called it the Rotten Hotel, <laughs> <laughs> into jail. And, um, yeah, uh, that was the first time, and um, uh, I was like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. My, uh, but my dad uh, showed up and bailed me out. Mm-hmm. That was my first DUI when I was 19. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't stop then. Um had two more, and um, probably should have been a couple more after that, too. But there, thank goodness there wasn't. I wrecked a car across the railroads one time under the influence, and the cop let me go. Mm-hmm. So I had to go to court, and my dad was there with me by my side all the time. So was my mom. He just never gave up on me, and they probably should have kicked me out of the house when I was still living there uh, many times, but they never did. They just had loving hearts and caring. It's not a lot of... They, I'd probably say they, they're they not a, a lot. They're not um, like a lot of other parents that I've seen through some friends through school. Mm-hmm. You know, they're a lot different. They're just so caring and took care of me, was there for me through my addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was there every through those DUIs I had to bail me out of jail. I made sure the last time I got bailed out that I was going to keep my nose clean. Yeah. You know, so he could get his money back. Yeah. And yeah. that, um, Apparently, I stayed clean there ever since that day. It's been a, a long time. Yeah. yeah, it's good. We'll hear about that here in a little bit. But there was one event that you had that you've talked to me about over 
the years, and it was a positive event as a kid. And there's some people listening that are going, I remember when we did that, Faith Ranch. <laughs> Can you share a little bit about the highlight that was in your life? You were going to Kids Harbor here, and you got invited to go with, I think, Heidi Dove oh, yeah. um, to Faith Ranch, which was a horse ranch somewhere in Ohio, I believe. And I know that that impacted you um, powerfully. Tell us a little bit about that. In fact, I can remember some people years ago, like Leighton Schaefer. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, she was there, and um, like you said, uh, Kim Adams mm-hmm. was there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and my dad drove one of the vans down for us. And uh, I remember one day it rained really hard there. <laughs> and uh, he hit the puddle as fast as he could, and we loved it, and we got all muddy, falling in the mud puddles and everything. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and uh, a lot of fun riding horses. I mer- even remember my horse's name still today, mm-hmm. Coco, and it was a pretty horse, and rode the trails, and we all liked when they ran back to the barn because they knew what they were getting. Uh. But then the ride, you know, they just... Sprint back to the barn. They're going to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a horse actually stepped on me and, uh, and while we were in the barn. And boy, did I scream. And Kim came running over the yard. I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it was a fun time, uh, especially getting close to God and friends, mm-hmm. and family, yeah. and good food. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. I didn't want to miss that because um, yeah. I know that impacted your faith. Well, Jacob, Pastor Margaret was talking about when she first met you, and I haven't known you quite as long, but I remember uh, meeting you through the college and young adult group here at the church um, that met a number of years ago, and Pastor Billy led that, and we met here at the church, and uh, actually we were talking a little bit about that um, when you first came today, um, because uh, your dad stopped by uh, to wish you good luck today as you're sharing your testimony, and you asked if I had ever met your dad, and I was like, well, there was a number of years ago when the young adult group was meeting, and uh, we one summer, one night, uh, your parents invited the group over and had food and stuff out in their backyard, and so I just remember um, that group and being a part of that and you being a part of that, and uh, so just anything you know, that you want to share, whether it's things like Faith Ranch that Pastor Margaret mentioned, being at Kids Harbor, being in the young adult group, just different things that you can look back on your life that had an impact. Maybe you didn't realize it at the time, but maybe you realize it now. (laughs) Yeah, I can remember a lot of things in this church. I was 15 years old, probably. That's when I first started coming on Wednesday nights. Like today, Mm -hmm. tonight we would have youth group. Pastor Billy, and by the way, he was just amazing at that. I always liked being around him. He's done a lot for me also in my life. I've known him for almost six years now. He's a good guy. And uh, I remember every Wednesday night we would have the best food and snacks and Kool-Aid, I think we had, and water. <laughs> and we would worship on um, a young lady named Amanda that would sing. I always enjoyed listening to her. She was always a really good singer. And uh, that impacted my life especially the worship Mm -hmm. and uh, all the sermons that Billy ever spoke there. And that's actually how I met my first girlfriend here through church (laughs) (laughs) many years ago. (laughs) That's great. And, um, yeah, uh, I remember also remember Grayson's dad, Pastor Kerry. He had a big impact in my life, too, when I was a kid. Yeah, you can look back and see the people that God placed in your life to just show you his love. And so that is powerful. So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm going to guess that when we have um, addiction, there's usually a reason. We're usually trying to drown pain, and I think that kind of become a normal in your life. It was in mine at one time, too. Um, Tell us about your journey um, out of addiction. We know that you would do good for a while, right? And uh, But tell us about what that journey looked like when you didn't want your dad to have to yeah, with that last time you made a decision. What was happening around that time that impacted that decision? Like, I know you were coming to CR, and I know that you you met some people there um, that began to walk with you. So, and, and it was an up and down, right? It wasn't just you showed up and everything went smooth. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, tell us about that journey out of your addiction. Well, there's two Pacific guys I met here. When I first started in the Celebrate Recovery, it was Nathan Carr and 
um, Lewis, those two guys, <laughs> they really stuck with me through the beginning when I first met them and still do today. And, um, yeah, um, I thought CR was pretty neat. I actually remember when I first started, I didn't even know there was a Celebrate Recovery here. It was uh, Dr. Um, Ron Schubert's group mm-hmm. that I started coming to that I heard about. And I was walking out one evening after group, and I saw a sign for CR. It was upstairs. I was like, what is that? So I sat in, and I actually came up here and sat in it, and uh, I really liked it. I needed help. Yeah. <laughs> I was scared to ask for help. So I started coming and been coming here for many years to CR. But, yeah, outside the addiction part, it was, was um, I think it was pretty hard because um, I do good for a while, and then I get real down, and that's how relapses happen, obviously. Yeah. But um, it was like a pattern for quite a few years. So, yeah. So I got it right. Yeah. I know that you did a step study at one time. Mm-hmm. Like, I've tried to, like, I don't know what it was that finally kind of helped you to take a different path. Like, you go down the road, you fall in the same hole. You don't take the same road. But we do, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, a few times sometimes before we get it. And what happens is, we may fall back in that hole, but we don't stay in it as long. And I think that happened for you. Like, it was less time going down the wrong road each time. Like, you were able to. And now you have some sobriety under your belt. How long? Well, I have um, probably close to 800 days or something like that. Wow. So it's over two years. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations on yeah, that. I know that's just huge. Um and you probably thought you could never do it, but it's just no. a one day at a time, yeah. one moment at a time sometimes yeah. journey. Talk to us a little bit about that um, step study. If somebody was listening today and they're like, you know, I have some things that I keep falling, going down the same road, falling in the same hole. It might be addiction to alcohol. It might be Facebook, whatever. It is. You know, we all have things that we um, can turn to could be food. Um, maybe we're in a relationship where we want to say no to someone, but we continue to say yes, mm-hmm. which is an implication of codependency. Um, so that's the other side of you have addiction and you have codependency. How did that step study impact your journey? Big time because I've tried step studies before and I never could get through them. This time was different. I don't know. It was God for real because... It was the guys in that group that really kept me, that were there for me Mm -hmm. and helped each other through the lessons and the questions that we answered. And for some reason this time it really clicked in my head and it helped me through my sobriety, you know, 100%. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could do another one because it's, I really enjoyed it. Oh, you can. Yeah, (laughs) I know that. (laughs) But anyways, you know, it was... um, Brian was the leader and Lewis was, and those guys are really good. And uh, just a whole group of guys that was in there was just really connect together mm-hmm. and were there for each other, and it helped me out through step study. I know that I've done step studies before, too, and it's a pretty big commitment. It's a six to nine months and sometimes longer to get through um, the 12 steps in a closed group. And, you know, we could walk in that room and look around and think, wow, nobody – Nobody will understand, like, what I've been through. And what happens is we realize that we're not that different from everybody else, that we all have struggles. Um, was that the – did you find that in your group? Like, all of a sudden you realize that you weren't alone in your journey, like that people – they're not going to understand exactly what you're going through, but they have understanding because they've been through things too. Yeah, 100%, absolutely. I've heard quite a few – Stories in there, and it's a lot of them, especially one I know, um, I struggled pretty good. Yeah. And it's just not you. It's as soon as you get in there and you open up, and everybody starts getting comfortable with each other, it's mm-hmm. like, whoa. You know, you hear everybody else's stories and issues they struggle with. Mm-hmm. And it's, to see the um, transformation from the beginning to the when you mm-hmm. graduate, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I love to watch that. Um, that transformation and you know it's not always easy because you have to go back and you have to look at all the stuff in your life and kind of do an inventory and walk through that um, has a lot to do with forgiveness and um, but I've watched your life be transformed and 
So, you know, there's you still are living out some consequences, right? Oh, yeah. But you're in freedom. You're yeah. living in freedom. And you have, I know one of the things that you talked about um, back a while ago, just you and I were having a conversation about you wanting to help other people and feeling like led to help with kids. And you've helped some in our Celebration Place program. And most recently, you've been helping a young man that I think you could probably see yourself in, in some ways. Talk about the joy that that has brought you, the gratitude for having found freedom, not that you never struggle, but you found freedom, um, and then the impact of helping others. How does that make you feel? Makes me feel really good because I'm also giving back to the community Mm -hmm. and helping through the church. And um, That's one thing when I was in my addiction I couldn't do because I couldn't stay clean long enough, you know. Mm -hmm. But looking at these little kids' eyes and and how much fun they were having playing Mm -hmm. and and it brings joy to me because I was their age in the same church, mm-hmm. the same thing. And um, it just brings joy to me to also to help this young man and to see how good he's doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, But, yeah, it brings joy to me yeah. a lot mm-hmm. just to look in those kids' faces. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's mm-hmm. And that's the beauty of when God uh, brings that transformation. And I think we we give back just out of a gratitude of what he's done. And so... Thank you for not just healing and walking away, but to engage in other people's lives. That's powerful. Yeah. If um, there's somebody listening today that they're on their road to recovery, and I don't know how far down that road, but just any encouragement to them, um, you know, just through your experience, um, just to continue to do what they need to do to stay either sober or whatever other issues they might have, in their recovery uh yeah uh one first thing was for me when i um got sober after that last conviction i had was i had to get rid of all my old friends i couldn't hang out with them anymore they would mm-hmm. just keep dragging me down and i that's how i stayed relapsing all the time second of all is uh put myself around good people in church yeah. that surrounded me that wanted to help me they actually wanted to be there for me to help get me sober and, um, yeah, it was probably a hard thing to do for some people, but I just eventually just deleted them and pushed them out of my life, surrounded myself with good people. Yeah. So if you don't do that, you're never going to make it through recovery. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I learned a lot. So. That's good. And if people um, know of people that are struggling, I know early on you mentioned about your parents supporting you and your grandmother being a huge prayer warrior praying for you. Just talk to the importance of those type of things so that people, if they have people in their lives that are struggling not to give up on them. Absolutely. My mom was one of those people too. She prayed a lot for me and I knew worried about me, Um, but she never gave up on me. She just wanted to help and to be there for me, try to support me through my addiction. Same with my father. And uh, especially my grandma Booker, my grandma Frank, both of those ladies were really prayer warriors, for real. <laughs> and um, but you could talk to my grandma Booker and sit there through for hours, and she would just listen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I was probably the only one I'd stop down there all the time when I lived up there, just to yeah. see her, be with her. Yeah. And um, but yeah, she never. Both my grandmas never gave up. They always prayed. Yeah. And, um, yeah. They just wanted me to do good and stay away from the wrong people. Yeah. And sometimes I wish they were still here to mm-hmm. see what I'm doing, but I know in heaven they know. Yeah. 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 Know that I'm doing fine. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, there was in your recovery, when you had had a relapse, um, that last relapse, you had a good bit of time under your belt, and we get a chip for... Um, you know, the first months and then for a year. Um, and those are something that in recovery that are really important to people because it signifies, hey, I made it this far and now I need to make it to get the next chip. And I remember something that happened that I was so impressed about. And I think it was when you did this, I think I realized just how serious you were about your recovery 
So you had earned quite a few chips, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you earned all these chips, and when you relapsed, you handed them all back in. I'll never <laughs> forget that because you needed to earn them again. Mm-hmm. And that's when I knew that you were serious about your recovery. Yeah. And so I've not said this to you, but every time that you're presented with a chip, there is such a celebration in my heart for you because I see God transforming you and you persevering. Um, and it's not all been easy. It's not been a just a walk in the park. But you keep on, through adversity, um, making right choices. And so I just wanted to mention that, how powerful that was to see you go, you know what, I've lost the right to these chips. I'm going to earn them back one at a time. So thank you for your perseverance and earning every chip. Yeah, you're welcome. That means a lot coming from you. Jacob, uh, I know there's probably a lot, but what right now, um, since we call this program Hope Talks, what right now brings you hope or the most hope in your life? Oh my. <laughs> first things first is uh, my sobriety. Yeah. Every day, uh, in the past, every day I used to get off work in construction and all those guys would drink all the time in there, and that's all we would do for a long time now when I get off work. It's uh, I just relax you now, yeah. yeah. um, eat dinner, and just thank the Lord that I'm yeah. sober every day. Because yeah. I never used to, you know, be able to say that. But yeah. second of all, probably um, my parents, yeah. and um, definitely my mom and dad. Yeah. So I'm glad they're still here to see me yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be 33 here shortly, and uh, it's just amazing. You know, I'm just glad I still have both my parents here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and third of all, um, um, brings me hope is, um, to have a good job, yeah. benefits and, um, a place to call home right. on my own. Cause right. that's another thing is I never thought I'd be able to have my own place ever wow. because yeah. the way my life was going with alcohol yeah. Yeah. and I'm just grateful and thankful to God. Is there anything that we haven't asked you already or that you haven't shared already that you would like to share? There is maybe one or two things I probably didn't, never mentioned before. Is, uh, when I, remember when I told you I had meningitis? Yeah. Going back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Elam Steiner and Harriet Steiner go to this church. Mm-hmm. And Elam was my mentor in high school. And he took me to Alaska fishing for, uh, I think it was a week or so. And... I'll never forget that. Yeah. I just came out of the hospital, and he promised me to take me, and sure enough, I was on an airplane. <laughs> and um, just to see the scenery up there and God's, that's definitely God's country to see. Yeah. So it was amazing. And uh, second thing was I went to a place called Teen Missions, and it was for troubled teenagers, and it was three and a half months, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to stay there. And I was 17, and I remember calling my dad, and he was like, no, you're staying. <laughs> <laughs> he had boundaries. He yeah. loved you, but he had boundaries. <laughs> yeah, so I had finally, finally, you know, um, stood it out, and I'm glad I did because yeah. it brought yeah, I'm glad I did, even though I had mosquito bites all over me coming back, and <laughs> it was so hot, over 100 degrees. It's called Merritt Island, Florida. Yeah. And I flew down there for that. It was a good experience there for yeah. Especially for a teenager. Yeah. Troubled one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, Jacob, thank you for joining us today for Hope Talks. It's been great to have you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Lord, I just pray a blessing over Jacob, and I thank you for the work you're doing in his life and the work you're going to continue to do in his life. And I thank you for how you're using him now mm-hmm. to have an impact on others, Lord, and help others, Lord. And I just pray that he continues to feel your presence on the hard days, Lord, and even on the good days, Lord, that he just knows that you're with him and within him, Lord. And I I just ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast of Hope Talks. We pray that as you've heard Jacob Booker's testimony today, that it truly has been a half hour of hope for your life. May God bless. Hope Talks is sponsored by Church of the Nazarene Harrisonburg in partnership with Sunshine Ministries. 
Thanks for listening to today's podcast of Hope Talks. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe for updates in the latest episodes. Also, if you're in the Harrisonburg, Rockingham County area, we invite you to listen on the radio each Sunday at noon on 1470 AM or 102.1 FM WBTX.